Before I can talk about the best show of the season, this video is sponsored by Next Stage Project, a startup VTuber company that was formed with the goal of providing state-of-the-art production quality to English language VTubers. The kind of perks that are usually only available to the biggest VTubers will be available to talent up front. Next Stage boasts plenty of 3D capabilities, combining top quality motion capture equipment with Unreal Engine, which has been used by some of the top Japanese developers to nail down an anime style. Motion capture tech has been getting better over time, and Next Stage aims to provide that technology, the support to create a unique original characters, and more to the talent they represent. Auditions are currently open until the end of the month. Just visit nextstageproject.com. I don't watch that much anime week to week these days. Instead, I'll usually get a general idea of what other people think and then marathon whatever looks interesting. I do that quite a lot around the end of the year, so I don't feel left out of anime of the year discussions. But you can see where I'm going with this. We're only a month into Spy Family's debut, and I'm already here to sing its praises. Sure, there are flashier things I could talk about. One Piece 1015, Orbital Children, Kaguya-sama, Princess Connect, but it only took a few episodes of Spy Family for me to open up Google Docs and start typing. Sure, it's still early days, but the creative teams at both Wit Studio and Cloverworks have made their intentions clear. To make a show that elevates everything about the manga. In 2019, director Kazuhiro Furuhashi got a call from Wit Studio to come in for a meeting, and while he had planned to turn down any offer they gave him, he figured it was worth hearing them out. But when he got there, they presented a volume of Spy Family, and gave him a bit of time to think. Furuhashi was busy, as is most of the anime industry these days, but he took their offer seriously and was impressed. Back in the 90s, he was known as the director of iconic series, like Hunter x Hunter and Rurouni Kenshin, before later directing Gundam Unicorn in 2010. This is a man who understands his icons, and felt that Spy Family's Anya Forger could likewise become an icon of the new Reiwa era. Honestly, judging by my Twitter timeline, she already is. Oh, and fun fact, the show's title, Spy Family with that silent X in the middle, was inspired by Hunter x Hunter. It all comes around. The choice to adapt Spy Family was not a hard one. Not only had the editors at Jump been extraordinarily confident in this being a hit in the first place, the data from the online debut confirmed it, showing that Spy Family was an internationally beloved series. In that way, it's no surprise that they gave it to Wit Studio, a team known for their popularity overseas. In fact, Wit Studio's been having a bit of an identity crisis lately. They were established as a way of getting away from the demands of Production IG's ongoing franchises, but when they got started, their first TV anime, Attack on Titan, ended up being so big that they struggled to make all that much else. Since passing that on to Mappa, they've been working to re-establish who they are and break out of the Titan typecasting. Part of that is in developing original series like Vivi and Vampire in the Garden. Part of it is in their collaborations with OLM on children's anime like Pokemon the Power of Us and Kedama no Gonjuro. And another part is in adapting manga that would benefit from their skills with action animation, but ultimately is still a different kind of show. For instance, Ranking of Kings and Spy Family. They're proud of their shows, even Bubble. They announced a 10th anniversary exhibit recently with all their work since Attack on Titan titled Aim Higher. And that's what they've been doing. But even with that said, the image crisis has resulted in a team that is absurdly busy. And so, when they were approached with Spy Family, they called up Cloverworks to help. The studio's presidents are friends from the anime studio meeting events, which they started holding in 2019, with a few casual live events in bars in between where you can pay to watch anime producers get drunk and talk shit. <laughs> So when they got together to make Spy Family, there wasn't rivalry. It was just another opportunity to hang out. 
The keyword for this production was sustainability. And from the way the producers talk about it, it does seem like they are preparing to work on more than just one 25 episode season. And Cloverworks in particular had been wanting to tackle a longer show, but didn't feel like they could handle it alone. The result is a 50-50 split. This isn't like Rising of the Shield Hero's second season, where the members of one studio take all the lead roles, while the members of the other make up most of the dog's body. Instead, the lead roles are divided. Kazuaki Shimada, the character designer, works at Cloverworks. Meanwhile, Kyoji Asano, his fellow chief animation director, works from Wit Studio. Hosting duties are split too. The storyboard meetings take place at Cloverworks, the director's checks take place at Wit. It's a tight collaboration that works thanks to their experience with remote work and an even allocation of roles. They've also divided the episodes between themselves. Every odd episode was created at Wit Studio, with every even episode being created at Cloverworks. But with production taking place mostly between these two major studios with their own culture and workflow, there was a large focus on trying to make it so that viewers can't tell the difference. And it's harder than you might think. They're constantly studying each other's work and taking notes. Simply put, if someone on your timeline is attributing Spy Family to one particular studio, they're talking out of their ass. Comedy anime is at its best when it's taking its jokes seriously. Nozaki has genuinely high quality shoujo manga art, Konosuba has incredible magic effects, and of course, Nichijo has set pieces like this. High effort comedy. Osamatsu san went so high effort with its first ever episode that it got nuked out of existence. <laughs> The conceit of Spy Family is that it's a serious spy thriller. Until it's not. But that only works because the spy drama is genuinely fun to watch. A lot of comedy anime are all about exaggerated movements and gags, but Furuhashi was very specific in that he wanted to make sure that all the movements felt naturalistic and the characters remained on model. Sure, Lloyd ends up in some stupid situations, but he always has to look cool when doing them. The team is constantly leaning into this. They're always looking for parts of the manga to punch up and put their own spin on. For instance, episode 5 has the cast recreate a scene from Spy Wars, Anya's favourite show. Yet, it's only a few pages in the manga. They plan out the roles, Anya hides behind a desk, and then Lloyd fights Yor. That's it. A good adaptation adapts the core of what makes the source material special. A brilliant adaptation makes it even better. Almost half of Spy Family's fifth episode, and honestly, the best part, is all original to the anime. The quiz, the comical yet cool fights with the goons, the impressively cinematic set pieces, this guy. It's an advantage of having an animator like Furuhashi also serving as a lead screenwriter. He can devise extra scenes that give the story even more impact, all with the knowledge that the animation talent he has on board can handle it. From the very start, it's been important to show that Lloyd is genuinely a proper expert spy. The fight in episode 1 was a big part of establishing this. This was actually one of the scenes Furuhashi was proudest of, and it's yet another reminder that the guy still got it. Hunter x Hunter 99 was my first anime, and so it's kind of cool to see that all those techniques, the fast close-up action, the multi-plane shots, the many focus shifts, they haven't gone anywhere, they're just achieved differently. One of the most exciting additions to the show are the POV shots in the storyboards. There are a couple of these kind of panels in the manga, but it's way more frequent in the anime. Whether it's Lloyd's drinking a coffee, receiving evidence from a spy, pointing Anya on her way, or stopping a runaway thief, it's both intimate and exciting to watch. Director Furuhashi storyboarded the first three episodes himself, and directed the first, establishing the look of the show early on with his surprisingly detailed drawings. And the goal for the whole team was that naturalistic movement I mentioned just before. It's not just about animation, it's about pacing. A lot of manga adaptations use the source material as a basis for their visuals, but while Furuhashi wasn't against that, he wanted to focus on the parts in between the panels. Here is a super basic example. Episode 1. Lloyd is on a train heading out for his next mission. He drinks a coffee and spits it out. 
The next time we see him in the manga, he's tearing apart the newspaper with both hands. So in the anime version, while he's reading, we get an extra shot where we see him put his coffee cup down. It's a small addition, but it makes the show feel smooth, suave. They're fine with taking cues from the manga as long as they can figure out how to turn it into cinematic language. If Yor is pacing in one panel and answering the phone in the next, then have a run for it in the anime. Everything has to lead into each other. Everything Thing has to be elegant. For them, the worst case scenario was making something with a load of boring static shots where characters are constantly teleporting about, like Shokugeki no Soma. That manga deserved better. But if it's Lloyd and Yours' jobs to deliver a proper exhilarating spy thriller, then it's Anya's to break that tension. While her parents both have a range of regular expressions on their character design sheets, Kazuaki Shimada made sure to fill Anya's full of the silly faces she's known for. They consulted the Tankabons a lot to work out how to turn Anya from a static image into an actual moving tiny gremlin. She moves much more than any other singular character, and so they spent a lot of time working out all the details. How athletic is she? How round is her head? How does she go from normal face to stupid face? And the result is that you get this mix between silly gags and proper, genuine childlike motions. The whole bit where she's showing Yor around the house is original to the anime. She's reaching up for the doorknobs, crawling onto her bed and flopping right over because that's what kids do. They're all a bit dumb and try to do things themselves. And also, like a lot of other children, Anya likes to be the centre of attention. Even when the scene isn't about her, she's still there, poking into the frame. After all, Anya is the star of the show, and she greedily ended up being the star of the opening and ending sequences as well. Fame's opening director Masashi Ishihama teamed up with his frequent collaborator Sada Morozaki to create a cute opening sequence at Wit Studio with a fun new visual style that looks to be inspired by pop art and cartoons from around the time of the Cold War. 40 seconds of this isn't enough. Meanwhile, fresh from his work on Shin Evangelion, director Atsushi Nishigori returned to Cloverworks to create an ending sequence based on Anya's imagination with some of the cutest Anya animations so far. I've watched this little dance on loop so many times. Even with both studios being individually busy, the timing has still kind of worked out for some big names to get involved. Wit Studios producer was particularly impressed that Cloverworks was managing to get some big names to draw storyboards. For instance, episode 4 was storyboarded by Tatsuyuki Nagai, the director of Anahana. They're always looking for people with a gap in their schedule to help make Spy Family even more special. Thanks for watching The Canopy Effect. This video is kind of a first impressions of Spy Family, but we've still got plenty to go with a total of 25 episodes split into two cores. Even then, this production is built for long-term sustainability. So my guess is that we're likely to see a second season announcement not too long after. Regardless, I'm sure I'll be back for a part two of this video at some point. But before I go, I'd like to thank these incredible people for supporting the channel. In particular, I'd like to thank Austin Hardwick, Chris Boylan, Dedemeet, Eddie Lehecker, Edwin Shale, Faux Wizard, Frizzy Canadian, Frogkun, Fujay, Jacob Bosley, JR Pictures, Mike Tamborelli, My Own Mother, Naila Drink, Nolan Soga, Ryland Taylor, Tom Araman, and Tiago Nascimento. If you want more videos like this, then please visit patreon.com slash thecanoperaffect. Mm -hmm.